it's my daunting task to uh, fulfill. Um, my task is to introduce Amit Chaudhary to an audience that already knows him. Um, so I'll, I'll try to say a few things um, and hope to make it interesting. So it'll al also end up sounding very silly because the thoughts are very nebulous. I'll just put them down. So I, I, I was at a job interview a few years ago at a Delhi magazine. And towards the end of the interview, the editor asked me, uh, he asked me a question I always dread being asked at job interviews, or anywhere else for that matter. He asked me, so you read, uh, who's your favorite writer? Um, I wanted to argue with him. I wanted to tell him that I try not to place writers in, cat in categories such as favorite, non-favorite. But wanting to get it over with, I came up with a name that was at the forefront of my mind, a name that's often at the forefront of my mind because I'm reading him and listening to him so much. I said, Amit Chaudhary. The editor's uh, follow-up question was uh, even more unanswerable and even more annoying. Uh, he said, why is he your favorite writer? And I, almost without thinking, said, uh, because it's important to read him. There were no further questions. The interview came to an end. I went home. And I never heard back from that editor. <laughs> Presumably, it had nothing to do with my taste in literature. It was more <laughs> so, more to do with my incompetence uh, as, a, as a handler of facts. But uh, that exchange made me think about the adjective important and when we apply to writers, uh, what is it that uh, makes writers important to us? Um, in Amit's case, there are many things, of course, but uh, mainly it is about the way he redefined two key terms for me, um, writer and writing. So he um, made me think about these two things. Um, he redefined what it means to write and what it means to be a writer. Now, uh, according to this new definition, a writer isn't somebody who signs publishing deals, who cultivates and consolidates readership, uh, and who produces books on schedule, like a cow produces milk, as Amit is fond of saying. Uh, a writer is a writer has to do these things, all, all of these things, but uh, these are not the things that make him a writer. And similarly, writing isn't merely about telling stories, about uh, weaving narratives, about sketching characters. It is those things, but it's much more than that. Writing uh, is a mode of engaging with the world. It is, it is a, in John Berger's famous phrase, it is a, it is a way of seeing. Even I would add a way of a way of living, and um, in, in according to uh, th this this new idea of writing is kind of predicated on the writer's presence and the writer's sensibility, which he ca which, which he can imbue every every encounter every experience with. And um, one of the most liberating things, uh, one of the most liberating ideas that I got from Amit's writings, is is uh, the idea that you don't have to write in order to be a writer. The way he separated writing from words, from, from language, and from writing itself. He's written about it in, a, in a, a beautiful essay, short essay, published in the Paris Review some time back. It's called The Moment of Writing. And he says that a moment, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, he says that the moment of writing begins before you put pen to paper. It, it, uh, it begins uh, when, when the imagination is interlocked with an image, with a memory. It begins with a dream, basically. And the writer, in this definition, is deprofessionalized and becomes a dreamer. You know, um, it's also it also um, made me think about uh, writing. It, it's liberating for me because as a as a writer, as someone who's trying to become one, still trying to become one, this uh, this new definition made me think of writing as a form of freedom, a uh, form of freedom from the constraints of genres and art forms, and, and also, most liberatingly, uh, writing as a form of freedom from writing. You know, um, and. And that made me think about this urge that writers throughout history have felt, the urge to do something other than writing. It's, it's in my view, a peculiarly writerly urge. Th this is the urge that sent John Berger to painting. It sent Susan Sontag to filmmaking. And it sends Amit Chaudhary to music. Uh, by the way, he's performing at ISE on the 26th, Hindustani Classical. And uh, in my view, he's among the best Hindustani Classical vocalists of his generation. If you don't believe me, just Google his Puriya Kalyan or Jog Bahar. Come for that if you can. Um, so this urge to do something other than writing has always consumed him. 
And, and to return to Sontag, and I want to close with this, um, Sontag defined the writer as someone in, interested in everything. And I think she had a similar dreamer figure, a truant figure, truant from writing, in, in, in her mind when she said that. So the most important writers of our time are those who live up to this definition, or at least who try to live up to this definition. And Amit Chaudhary is certainly one of them. So this is my response to that editor, mainly. <laughs> but also a short tribute uh, and a hopefully an appropriate welcome note for the writer, Amit Chaudhary. Uh, that was uh, that was an amazing uh, introduction. Very difficult to follow the talks that have preceded mine, and difficult to follow this uh, introduction. Um, you you said to me that uh, it was going to be a daunting task. I was very nervous while listening to you. I was thinking how nervous one is when listening to you know people introducing you um, or talking about you especially when they're saying nice things. Um, I, know, I was wondering, I mean, it's related to some of the questions that have been raised as to whether success exists. I mean, I should have been increasingly comf comfortable, growing more and more comfortable as you spoke, because you weren't criticizing me or having a go at me. I'm used to that as well, but or more used to that. But, um, but I've I found my heart racing, and, and not with joy, but with nervousness. Uh, but but I could I had enough of my consciousness intact to to realize that you know I should be grateful to you for that introduction. Um, now, more more apologies. Um, I I felt very early on after I decided that on failing, and that particular construction rather than failure. Uh, would be the would be the subject of this um, symposium on on literary activism, and after I'd written the concept note, I I, I knew I had nothing more to say. I uh, usually I mean I come up with the concept notes and and then there is something to add. I, I make a presentation. On this occasion, I have to say. I had exhausted all my ideas, my impulses, my my sense of excitement after having. Uh, done the uh, concept note and come up with on failing. I thought I've su su succeeded at coming up with a, with a fantastic uh, uh, title. Um, so, in the aftermath of of having nothing to say on this subject, I've, I've uh, often I speak from notes uh, when I have something to say because because I don't have anything to say. I've written it down uh, and and. Uh, so I'm going to read out uh, something that I've just arbitrarily written and called the intimacy of failing. It is a, the stock itself is is going is a failure after the, all the wonderful talks that I've been without exception absorbed by right from the start of yesterday to just before lunch. Everyone I asked to pa to participate in this symposium responded with immediacy and delight to the theme, saying they knew all about failing firsthand. The poet Anne Carson's reply, I mentioned it to her too late in the day for her to attend, was characteristic. Oh, I've had a lot of practice at that. Each response was a confession of intimacy made with a pride that was the antithesis of the kind that's symptomatic of social climbing. In India, we claim to know those who are already significant. We call them dear friends. And if we are academics, cite them in the acknowledgments pages of our books. Acknowledging failure, though, on the evidence of the reactions I had, gives us joy and liberates us from the rules of who and what and how to acknowledge. We reserve a special affection for failing, in a way we don't for the friends or colleagues we are proud to know. Many of my respondents laughed when I first mentioned the topic, as if failing was an aberration or a gift exhibited in childhood, which the world has now forgotten about. 
The laughter was not acerbic but tender. It's easy to be attached to failing. Success is what we appease and pay lip service to. With failing, we each have a distinct enduring relationship. We can joke about it as we can't about success, often riffing on exhausted variants of the same punchline. Versions of, I'm sorry, I will fail to attend your symposium because I already have a commitment at the time, came to me from many directions, as did in my head the thought, this time I failed to bring on bring to the symposium many of the speakers I wanted to. One doesn't joke about success in this silly way because it rules over us from a distance. A failure is ours. It will never desert us. A memory comes back to me from 2011. Some Indian writers in English had gathered in New York for an event called the China-India Dialogues where the names of the two nations were being invoked recurrently in the service of writerly self-promotion. The author's room was a nondescript space sequestered by curtains, and at one point I found the novelist Alan Seeley sitting there by himself, absorbed in the booklet he had in his hands. What are you reading, Alan? I asked. He looked up as if from a trance and showed me the bio notes of the authors. Given that these were, by, by prior directive, to be no longer than 200 words, each had an identifiable visual form as sonnets or haikus do. Perfect lives, such perfect, perfect lives, he said, as if responding to the beauty of each composition. A bio note must distill the essential successes. The ones that depart from this model are also subtly paying it obeisance. We perform the bit of our achievements or personality that we choose to and keep to ourselves the knowledge that, as Orwell said when reviewing Dali's autobiography, quote, a man who gives a good account of himself is probably lying since any life when viewed from the inside is simply a series of defeats. I got to know failure and failures early on, but I wasn't aware I had because these weren't the terms in which they were presented to me. I have in mind my maternal uncles, whom I always fall back on when I have nothing to say and or talk about. Each comprised a model to be avoided and an inheritance to ponder. I viewed them from an inviolable vantage point provided to me by my father, a vantage point threatened and energized whenever it came into contact with my uncles. My father had known this family, the four aristocratic Nundi Mojundas, since he was a child in Silhet. He was the best friend of the second youngest of the brothers, the wayward and gifted Radhesh. The fact that my father was an only child and his mother had died when he was seven years old meant he was always in and out of my mother's family home. It was either he or Radhesh who topped the class in school. But unlike Radhesh, this narrative was implicit in the stories my parents told me and vigorously confirmed by my uncle. He was not a genius and his progress as a result was more consistent in comparison to Radhesh's. In other words, common or garden success was to be my father's lot. There was an ideological position to these stories which instructed me that not everyone can be a failure. My father, setting aside his life as a parent and a husband, had two phases to his existence. The first involved his startling determined trajectory from Silhet to Calcutta to London to a job in Bombay to subsequent positions as finance director and then the the first Indian chief executive of Britannia Biscuits. He was a beautiful, modest man, and some thought he prospered for his beauty and sweetness of nature alone. The second had to do with his wife-like relationship with Radhesh, who remained single all his life, and the latter's fits of brilliance and attempts to frustrate his own endeavors. Behind every successful man, there may well be a woman, Alongside failures, too, there's a steadfast companion. 
The companion salvages, but also protects Failing's pristine qualities, having at some point noted their importance. The companion may lack singularity, but has the ability to spot it in another. My father's relationship to Radhesh was a one-sided one of nurture. Radhesh's father, a civil engineer, had died from falling off his Australian horse when Radhesh was three years old. This led to a permanent lapse in status in my mother's family and to the dominion of idiosyncrasy. My father, by contrast, merely came from a land-owning family. Radhesh, deemed by my father to be academically the most outstanding boy in his school, invariably found obstacles in the path of study. One was related to his fear of catching venereal disease, the August-sounding VD. He was convinced he could get it from any source, including urinals and the pages of textbooks. My father visiting him, him one day found him hardly able to turn the pages. His grades plunged during this tussle with contagion. My father advised him, but also, I suspect, sh shielded him from censure, waiting for the phase to play itself out. My father had, long, uh, had conventional long-term goals, but entertained unconventional long-term ones, best known to himself when it came to Radhesh. Then there was the episode to do with Radhesh asking his chemistry teacher on the street, Sir, how well do I need to know my chemistry text to do well at the exam? The teacher remarked, you should know every word in it twice over. My uncle, a blind devotee of Tagore, but a literalist when he chose to be, embarked on this project straight away but didn't complete it in time to take the chemistry paper. In college, while doing what was then called the intermediate, the stage before the BA, Radish was concerned with chemistry again. Convinced he hadn't prepared enough, he asked his teacher if he could repeat a year. Radish gave up on university at this point, a glitch whose significance was glossed over in the distraction of partition. The family moved to Silhet from the fa family moved from Silhet to Shillong. Here, Radhesh became a car broker, a conduit between buyers and sellers. Uh, can you just switch off that cell phone, if you don't mind? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, if, I, if, if the talk has to be sabotaged, I, I need to do it. Uh, nobody else should get that privilege. Uh, my father uh, had, meanwhile, gone to Scottish Church College in Calcutta got himself a star in his BA degree with a letter in English literature. Then he changed course, the equivalent of law conversion today, and gone to England to do chartered accountancy. Six years later, he was joined in London by Radish's younger sister, my mother, whom he proposed to in 1949, before leaving India and then seemingly forgotten. Once my parents were married, they decided they must rescue the wastrel from car brokering and bring him to England. In England, Radhesh chose to take the impossibly difficult chartered shipbroker's exams. The exaggeratedly lucrative domain of shipping was generally proscribed to non-whites and anyone who hadn't been to a public school. Radhesh uh, stood first in England and the Commonwealth in the exam. My parents returned to India in 1961. Radish joined Philip Brothers, the biggest shipping firm in what's known as the city. He lived in a bedsit, sent money to other brothers in Shillong, urinated in bottles at night, and began to stay back in office well after midnight doing his junior's work. When my father became CEO, he revealed to him that he'd been offered a directorship at Philip Brothers, which he turned down because it would involve too much travel. Of the other brothers, three come to mind. Radish's Mejda, the second oldest. The story of him daydreaming when he was meant to be preparing for his BA. From a distance, it seemed he was inscribing something in the textbook. When his mother went near him, she found he was pains painstakingly writing in ornate letters the words, 
जे पी नोंदी बी ए शी हिट हिज हैंड सो हार्ड विद अ रूलर दैट शी फ्रैक्चर हिज थम्ब जे पी नोंदी पास्ट हिज बी ए एंड देन बिकेम ए बिजनेसमैन फाइनली ही टर्न इन टू मिस्टिक हु लिसन टू डिवोशनल सॉन्ग्स ऑल डे ऑन हिज ग्रामोफोन Radesh Chhodda the brother he was immediately junior to was a man of great er- erudition and literary talent he became famous in silhet when a poem of his appeared in desh bengal's leading literary weekly when he was 15 years old he shone at university and then became a private tutor he decided to appear for the indian administrative service exams there could be few more suitable candidates in shillong One of the questions that year was translate the national anthem into English. Chhodda found he couldn't remember the words. Naturally he failed. He took the Assam administrative service exam later and became additional deputy district commissioner in Shillong. Taking no bribes he was poor after he retired. He was one of those Radhesh sent money to and fulminated about in his isolation. The youngest of the siblings was called Dukhu from the Bengali word dukho or sorrow because he was born after his father died There's nothing sorrowful about him he was impetuous and sang beautifully as did my mother who was a year younger than Radhesh and a year older than Dukhu Dukhu became a mechanical engineer trained in Germany returned to Calcutta and joined a leading German firm Then just as he was going to be transferred to Delhi he resigned and started a business in agriculture related machinery designed by him because he could neither abide being in someone else's employ nor countenance being deprived as he would have been in delhi of gorihat markets fresh water fish his friends wanted to be partners in the firm he accommodated them until my mother my aunt says his own position in it was no longer reliable the machines he made were excellent but the marketing was dreadful One of his great inventions was the name he gave the company Crushmore Maxban. The first words appositeness being self-evident, the second word the miraculous product via the letter X of a marriage between Ma from Majumdar and Ban from Bani, the name of a partner's wife. Dukhu had no head for business. The helpings of goat's meat curry in the factory at Howrah on Vishwakarma Puja became epic through repetition. One of the oversized nephews Kutu would accept third and fourth servings encouraging others khao khao company borwa se dialect for eat freely it's a big company Dukhu is the only remaining sibling of four brothers one half brother and two sisters we visited him recently he's 92 his wife reviews his decision to give up his job as if it happened yesterday she's transported to the aftermath so am i though i have no memory of it i would have been two at the time but it's like a poem i can memorize and never fully understand it has that capacity for surprise she reveals a detail i never knew about the last days of her husband's employment at night i'd wake up to see him frowning and drawing diagrams he was designing those machines then abandoning the reverie she sighs anyway it's done now i viewed this past and its continuation into the present through the safety of the world my father had created in bombay the flat on malabar hill the company car with chauffeur the stretch between Lit- little gibbs road and nariman point and apollo bandar i knew from these living examples that there was a life outside success in relation to which the nuclear family home on malabar hill loving and deeply comfortable as it was was constricted my father as he ascended knew it too which is why neither silhet nor my uncle's idiosyncrasies ever became invalid for him they remained infuriating and persuasive they were the kind of people he said of the brothers who would spend the entire morning arguing about which was the superior fruit the mango or the orange or who was the greater singer shochinde bormon or vishwadev chatterjee and they would come to blows in the end we would shake our heads as people do at accounts of fabulous animals 
that have ensured their own demise and vanished from the earth. But there was also a warmth to our bewilderment because of this grotesquely exaggerated surrender to what we deemed unimportant. And the neglect of what I in school was being told repeatedly but without real conviction was valuable. My uncles, as well as Silhet and then Calcutta, where the youngest brother lived, became for me part of an education linked to desire. Not to be what I was expected to be, but to allow myself to find out why it was crucial to decide between the mango and the orange. With this arose the question, why was there no scheme, earthly or divine, for this compulsive search for value? Then, before long, arose a seeming non sequitur. Why was there no consensus about or reward for the truly excellent? One sees now why the debate about the mango and the orange was so freighted, and I understand in retrospect why my uncle in Calcutta so took it to heart when I said I didn't care for katla fish. Education has to do with what you want to become, or where, or who you want to be. What you want to become is not a blueprint, it's what you feel in moments of absorption and enchantment. It has less to do with the ambition to go somewhere than with the desire that takes you out of yourself. So Cezanne paints the Montagna Saint Victoire is, painting the Saint Montagna Saint Victoire is already physically present at the scene. But it's only in the paintings that the desire to be present is manifest and is palpable. It's a longing that has nothing to do with reaching the destination or being there. As I began to discover the unrewarded nature of achievement, I began to experience, while growing up, an absorption in the subject of the discovery, that is, in the unrecognized one, that was a variant of intimacy, not just to understand why the person was unrecognized, to but, but to become, in the moment of bafflement, who they were. One sub such subject of repeated reverie was my mother. How could a singer of such purity of tone not be famous? Record after record came out, but she was like a mythical creature, inaudible to passers-by. First I investigated the question, then I immersed myself in it. My music teacher, Govind Prasad Jaipurwale, one of the great virtuosos of his generation, who died when he was 44. His father, Lakshman Prasad Jaipurwale, the greatest creator of khayal compositions of his time and an extraordinary singer. Why are these names not on everyone's lips? At some point, I give up on disappointment. Confronting failing repeatedly allows me to enter a state of absorption. Inevitably, a family comes into being. Only I know its members. I make a catalogue. I'm transfixed by William Gedney. The beauty of his photographs is as difficult to pinpoint as are the reasons for Gedney's obscurity in his lifetime. As I turn from photograph to photograph, I find it impossible to separate the, singularities of the singularity of the images from the resistance beauty has to become to becoming immediately visible. In this sense, an artist's reputation or the place of excellence in the world is as inexplicable as a human being's future. I find it difficult to demarcate the intimacy I feel with the nature of Walter Benjamin's work from the immersion I experience when thinking of his decision upon returning from the French-Spanish border, where he was told his papers were inadequate to take morphine and end his life. He actually had the necessary papers and would have gone through with other refugees the next day. I hoard this detail. It's part of a form of research. Underneath my father's accommodation of my mother's brothers must have been the knowledge that acting in the right way, thinking and saying the right things, precludes access to not only a significant domain of experience but to truth. His background, the only child of a landowner, the son of a mother who committed suicide when he was seven, 
may or may not explain his kind of patience, just as it may or may not account for his journey towards becoming the CEO of a multinational company in Bombay. But the tolerance of idiosyncrasy, which is basically a term for the inculcation of self-impediment, is very different from the liberal, multicultural or constitutional tolerance of a multiplicity of world views or religions. It's to accept an aberration from the correct way of thinking, from the proper life, in the interests of what one might call, in the absence of a more intelligible term, spiritual truth. It's a way of responding to the world that we've forgotten alongside our forgetting of the many histories of failing. Thinking back now, I realize that my uncles prepared me for certain tonalities and contra contradictions in literature, for its curiously antithetical relationship to likability. The curmudgeonly and its companionship with new registers of meaning. Philip Larkin and his poems, especially Mr. Bleeny and Dockery and Son, I wonder in what way I would have received them or heard their voice if I hadn't known Radhesh. Here is the narrator of Dockery and Son thinking back to his school acquaintance as he sums up his life in a moment of transition and wakefulness. But Dockery, good Lord, anyone up to today must have been born in 43 when I was 21. If he was younger, did he get this son at 19, 20? Was he that withdrawn, high-collared public schoolboy sharing rooms with Cartwright who was killed? Well, it just shows how much, how little yawning, I suppose, I fell asleep waking at the fumes and furnace glares of Sheffield where I changed and ate an awful pie and walked along the platform to its end to see the ranged joining and parting lines reflect a strong, unhindered moon. To have no son, no wife, no house or land still seemed quite natural. Only a numbness registered the shock of finding out how much had gone of life, how widely from the others. Dockery now. Only 19, he must have taken stock of what he wanted and been capable of. No, that's not the difference. Rather, how convinced he was he should be added to. Why did he think adding meant increase? To me, it was dilution. Where do these innate assumptions come from, not from what we think truest or most want to do. Those warp tight shut like doors. The more a style our lives bring with them, habit for a while, suddenly they harden into all we've got and how we got it. Looked back on, they rear like sand clouds, thick and close, embodying for Dockery a sun, for me nothing. Nothing with all a sun's harsh Patronage. I know that Radhesh too exhorted whoever would listen that adding was dilution, though I'm not certain that what he'd engendered in the end was nothing with, a, with all a son's harsh patronage. Nothing is a complex and underrated idea. Whether the narrator of Dockery and Son represents a feasible model for existence, whether he's wrong or right is besides the point. What's instructs, instructive is the means by which many of us can be persuaded to keep such a person's company, or our in inexplicable friendship with Larkin's casual, less than palliative tone. In my final year at University College London, I recognized the persuasiveness of not only an inappropriate style of living, but of a resistant language, and wrote a dissertation on Larkin called Lyrical Elements in an Anti-Lyrical Voice. As far as I recall, I don't think I argued that one was a vehicle for the other, but that they both subsisted in the same ecology. I'm creating these specious contiguities more than three and a half decades later, but I was very aware by the time I began my defil on the poetry of D.H. Lawrence of my uncle's contribution to my cultural temper. I'd become, specifically interest, I'd become interested specifically in Lawrence's unevenness, his, in the eyes of his critics, inconsistency, his tendency to be, according to them, both a great and a bad writer, 
to fulfill and betray ex expectations, to lapse from the extraordinary to the intolerable. I was intrigued also by the nature of my interest, by the low threshold exhibited by contemporaries such as T.S. Eliot when confronted with unevenness of style or thought, by my own comparative calm and willingness to embrace Lawrence in his entirety rather than just make room for his most fully realized poems and fiction, echoing the calm I felt in the face of Radish's various forms of hectoring in London and my father's patience when it came to his friend. Here is Eliot, reviewing John Middleton Murray's study of Lawrence and offering his own assess assessment of the author. Quote, Lawrence was not a pure artist in that he never succeeded in making a work of art. He had plenty of sensations, undoubtedly. No man of his time was more sensitive, but he could neither leave his sensations alone and accept them simply as they came, nor could he generalize them correctly. End quote. My father and I had approached Eliot's position when it came to Radhish. Yet we shared a conviction without ever expressing it to each other openly of the validity of disorganization, of difficulty, not in the sense that Eliot would have understood it as a mastery of craft, but as a lapse in the sensible and as a, as a life-giving interdependency between excellence and idiocy, being a tenable working model. But to me, Eliot continues, his achievements indicate that Lawrence ought to have been a pure artist but was impure. And I wonder also whether had Lawrence been a success in this sense instead of a failure, Mr. Murray would have been so interested in him." Unquote. I wasn't struck by Lawrence's failure because I didn't think of him as one. This is because of a background in which my uncles had come to me not only as the sum total of their lives, but as excess. This had given me the capacity not so much to have an insight into, but to understand. As you might say, I understand when considering the errant actions of one you're intimate with, Lawrence's language. It would be wrong to say that Having grown up in a desultory, aimless world, I find myself living since the 1990s in an age of success, that is, in a time to which success is all important. We live in an age of survival. Success is no longer the fruit of achievement. It's the difference between existence and obliteration. Consequently, the successful and the unsuccessful are equally marked by desperation. I sensed this from 1991 onwards, two years after the Berlin Wall came down and communism ended when my first novel was published. I knew already that I had embarked on an eccentric trajectory, that what I'd chosen to write wasn't in keeping with the boom in Indian writing in English or in the novel in general. Yet I reaped some of the benefits of that boom under false pretenses, until I realized, not for reasons of morality, but in the interests of whatever was creative in me, that, that I must protect myself from it. At the end of the last millennium, I fled England for Calcutta. For a while, I abandoned the novel. I played with the extent to which I could approach unpubli unpublishability. In the early 2000s, I concluded that I must continue to publish in order to write unpublishable work. From stupidity, the inability to make peace with things arises the work. There's no good time now to send the work out into the world. On publication day, you feel the opposite of belatedness. You pray the book is treated well, but regret its publication because you're convinced it deserves something better. Writing books is not at all like having children and sending them out into the world. I had started dreaming of ignoring success till I came to terms with the dream's untenability. I can't fail 
purely because my failure then will, par will be paradoxically non-existent. In capitalism, only success has existence. There are no alternative negative modes of subsistence. For my failure to exist now, I must invent ways of succeeding slightly. I test the temperature from moment to moment because it's important to check the conditions that make this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And that sort of uh, reminded us of uh, how failure has been a subject that you have approached from different angles in both your fiction and your criticism. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I wanted to, um, we'll open this up soon, but I wanted to. It's maybe still not work. How uh, close? This is fine. <laughs> so I wanted to start this off with a couple of points. One, um, my sources here tell me that you were trying to um, get um, a, a person, a friend of yours, uh, at this uh, to this seminar. Yes. And this is uh, on whom the character of Ramu. Oh, I mean that I, I want to leave uh, sort of unaddressed. Whether, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanted to ask you how. Yeah. What would you have? Would you have introduced him as? No, no, no. Uh, I, I mean, I don't even want to say that I was inviting a person on whom the character Ramu in Friend of My Youth was based. Mm. I wanted to inv invite a friend of mine to, to yeah. speak, uh, to be in conversation with me. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, um, and, and, and this friend of mine is somebody who would have been, uh, um, who would have had the distinction in comparison to all the rest of us who have spoken here or are about to speak, of, of n never having succeeded in any way. Uh, only having failed, um, I, uh, uh, he's a person uh, whom I've known s maybe since I was 13 years old. Um, and um, so he failed twice to, so he's two years older than me, so he failed twice to then become my contemporary in class. The second time he failed, he became my contemporary. Um, and. Um, and then we, we we were friends on and off, and uh, he then lapsed into drug addiction, and then in, in finally got out of drug addiction. Uh, my 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 uh, um, my intention in 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 calling him here was to negotiate a number of um, risks and see whether I could overcome them, in terms of. Uh, to, to be in conversation with a person I have great affection for and great respect for and find fascinating, but none of them to do with triumphing over failure, and none of them to do with his suffering and his 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 kind of his his uh, his drug addiction and his relationship to it, to it, but purely with the kind of person he is and whether the person he is really is dependent in any way uh, and my respect for him to uh, to failure or success or whether those two things are. Uh, 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 irrelevant to, to, to this question, but also the relevance of of his various forms of failing, uh, elective failing in terms of um, feeling life is too hollow to be engaged with uh, um, uh, as, as something that was part of his temperament very clearly from very early on. So he was he was um, he was a star of, of a kind in school uh, because he was he was an extremely talented sportsman uh, and 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 he was a gymnast uh, and so the, the 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 first time I saw him was when I was when we were quite small and and I can't remember which class but uh, he he did a kind of exhibition for us uh, on on the parallel parallel bars because because of his star status. I, I, during assembly, I mean, so, I, this is a memory that he was, he was, he was showcased for his talents. He was clearly uh, very, very um, glum about the whole business of this exhibition. Uh, and and then the other 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 um, 
moment in which I spectated upon him was um, again before I got to know him, uh, which would uh, probably a year before he failed again, and th and and this was um, so he was also a star boxer. He was supposed to be a, he was an amazing boxer, and 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 so the, in the boxing finals, he uh, fought against another boy. Uh, who was a kind of self-consciously hero-like figure, um, a, 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 a boy called uh, Sanjay Khanna. Um, now, now Suresh also, uh, the, the person I was going to call, is al so also could have been a hero-like figure. He was a, a good-looking, slightly diminutive at that uh, age. He, he grew tall later, but, but you know, stylish and good-looking, but um, uh, curiously antithetical to taking part in what was the main star system in school, which, had, which is cathedral school, which had nothing to do with academia, but with sporting success. Because you know, it was co-educational school too, so you know, boys became popular with girls primarily th through that, uh, you know, through achievements in that, in that field, not through doing well in exams. Uh, so um, so he, he had the potential to, uh, to exploit his stardom. Anyway, so going back to the, the, the that, that moment where two stars were, 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 were confronting each other, Sanjay Khanna, uh, the, who knew he was a star, and Sur Suresh, who seemed uh, unhappy about his status and unhappy about the bout. So he fought very well, but he fought completely defensively. Uh, and, and, and Sanjay Khanna won. But the best technical boxer award was given to Suresh. So we, we cheered. I mean, in him we had found this extraordinary, uh, a, a reluctant hero. You know, mm. um, I w I had wanted to talk to him about all of this. Of course, he's mm. not conscious of of yeah. having done anything but but failed in a sense. Uh, I so I was wondering whether I could walk that tightrope where we could talk about these things and what 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 it had meant to me and to him, uh, and what what the. Also to explore how much like him I was, you know. He mm. said, "You're like me, uh, you know. Uh, you you have succeeded." He said, which is mm. obviously his point of view, not mine, because I, uh, but uh, and and I have failed at everything I've done. Th then I said, "But we both we, we, we I, I resorted to teenage speak. I said we both hated the system, if you remember." And he said, "Yes, that's true. We I do remember that. You were very blatant about it, and." I wanted to explore our similarities as well, but it would have been a, a very risky affair bec uh, because I didn't want to exoticize him. There was no story of also either of as as, as we were talking about in terms of failed it of, of of final triumph that comes out of failure. So there there, there were no accolades in, in yeah. the end. So um, th that's 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 uh, that's something I, I wanted to see whether it is possible to talk about. Failure not as an abject state, mm. an accolade-less state as well, but not a, not a state of abjection, which is uh, interesting for its misery, but which allows a person to be, in their own way, independent. I think that that's that's what I liked about him: his indip his, his his independence to a certain uh, extent, mm. a greater extent than many others. Right. Um, the second point that I want to make, yeah, before we open it up, uh, has to do with uh, criticism as a form of failure. In, in, your, in your work and in, in what you just read out, we, we saw the writer transitioning into a critic or the novelist. And, um, and I often um, see that in your, in your, in your writings. Um, I think the mic. Maybe use mine. So, yeah, this is better. So George Steiner, who passed away recently, called the, the critic an artist non -K. Um And I just wanted to uh, know what you I wanted to ask you what you think about it about um, the decline of um, the disappearance of the artist critic from the literary landscape and does it have to do with the the fear that that um, writers feel of failing in their creative pursuit right the 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 last point is interesting because yes there is an anti intellectual kind of uh, um, tendency that has been in, encouraged among anglophone writers, and especially with the rise of the novel, uh, that writers, if they talk uh, at uh, uh, usually it's literary festivals or book launches, must talk about uh, you know what time of day they write or 
whether they write longhand or w w in, uh, on a computer, um, and and that's the that's the kind of uh, that's that's the kind of thing you get out of writers, you know. Um, it's different with poets, though, and and. Uh, Again, poets don't have much to fall back on, as, be, as has been pointed out. They don't have much to fall back on in terms of worthy themes. Uh, with cinema, uh, as, as Shotrajit Ray said, I mean, the, some of the worst films have been made about the noblest of themes. You know, and, and, and uh, this is true of uh, novels as well, that they, they can be identified and taught purely according to, to the significance of the theme. And I know that they are done. So especially now, uh, in 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 a post-colonial kind of environment, where you know you want to teach a novel about this particular uh, bit of post-coloniality or or, or or whatever. Um, so, with with poetry, uh, I, I I don't think you can. There's that, that there are there's that kind of dimension to fall back on. So you begin to come to terms with this whole pointless activ activity of, of arranging words in a particular way. And then and connected to that, to that this very particular form of pointless reading, which connected to other forms of reading which have a point, uh, is, is uh, the status of this form of reading is also, and the excitement it generates, is also puzzling and mor morally an open question. As to as to what what space it occupies in in our culture and wh wh why it has this long history, mm -hmm. one has to c uh, continually uh, look upon it again and again as as a poet. So uh, I find that uh, no, uh, the people who who write novels at uh, who who are writing novels in uh, in as students have begun writing novels at in, at, at UEA, for instance, at the University of East Anglia, uh, the the fiction writers uh, generally have been encouraged to, and they have agreed to mainly talk about craft, or preoccupy themselves with craft. Uh, and by craft, I mean, uh, is this sentence working? Is there, is there, uh, do I need that adjective there? Or is the, is the character working? Or do I need another minor character? There is a minor character fully realized. Um, while the poets uh, uh, enter into a different kind of uh, conversation, uh, about, I mean, at least that's what I've seen in some of the seminars that I've led, that they are more willing to deal with uh, theoretical questions and theoretical questions that underlie literature. Uh, I mean, just 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 to give you one example, uh, why why should we privilege a a sad ending over a happy ending? Th that that th there is a whole uh, theoretical context that can open up. Uh, when I say theoretical, I don't mean in a dry, uh, anti-aesthetic way. I, I mean in a way that is self-reflexive, but in, uh, in a way that allows us to reformulate our own aesthetic concerns. So th this, I think the poets are more attuned to our alive, to are more willing to do, while the, wh while the prose writers have become um, more and more have been asked to be concerned with with the craft of writing alone, uh, which itself is a is a is a theoretical choice. You know this 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 this, this um, the importance given to craft uh, at a certain point of time. Um, they've they've been asked not to be set. They've been asked to hone their skills, which is a great thing. But I think the uh, self reflexivity is not part of the discussion. So why are we doing this? This question was raised to me once by a student at Columbia University, uh, and I was telling my students at Ashoka about this recently. Uh, I was teaching them a story that I had included in the vintage book of modern Indian literature by the Malayalam writer Bashir, the great writer Bashir. And I was saying, uh, telling them about how in this particular very wonderful story called uh, Walls, which is about Bashir himself, he, he calls himself Bashir in the in the story, and this is one of the, in the in the Picador anthology, this is one of the many instances of autofiction before that ugly word came up, long before it came up. Um, uh, so B Bashir is in prison. He's made peace with the warden. Uh, he's he, he's he's 
he's a he's a freedom he's been in, engaged in the free, freedom struggle so which is why he's in prison he's leading a, a, a happy enough life the warden lets him write the, uh, the only problem is that at night he can't sleep because the electric there's a huge light that stays on all through the night so suddenly he breaks from the narrative to launch into this seemingly inappropriate but exuberant apostrophe to, to night and darkness. Oh, darkness, he says, in a way that usually uh, a, a modern um, writer of, of realist fiction shouldn't. Suddenly, the, 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 the passage is firstly full of exclam exclamation marks, another uh, 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 source of embarrassment to any serious writer. So there, there, there's a passage riddled with exclamation marks, uh, kind of recording this enthusiastic, uh, uh, you know, apostrophe paean to darkness, which he's now bereft from. We read it, we enjoyed it, we laughed at it, as we do at failure, without being, with, with, while 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 seeing it from from something of a distance. And 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 then one of the students said to me, "Why is it that when 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 we get kind of excess and sentimentality in?" Undace, we don't like it, but why do I like it over here? Now, these are the questions which have theoretical underpinnings, into which, which are also aesthetically alive, uh, which you don't, uh, which, you, which you put to one side if you're only kind of inhabiting a world where certain predetermined ideas to do with craft, which would then mean that we can't have that passage and we can't have the exclamation marks if, if those were at play. Right. So I want to ask you about the novel, but maybe someone else from here sure. would. Um, we'll open it up. Yes. I think yeah, he's, he's uh, in. He's not in. No. There's absolutely no difference from, you know. Can you hear the question? Yes, I can. Um, I, I mean, I just wanted to um, ask you also about the intimacy of the book. And um, as I understood it from your talk, this has to do with the experience of being in a family. Because in that sense, the family. John, you're about to get another mic. Um, okay. and, uh, it's also there. Doesn't work. Um, that was just like a <laughs> ritualistic <laughs> sort of. Uh, and, okay. yeah. I wanted to, I, while you were talking in this way, I thought, well, yes, two things that, which are a really question Short word, as, well as, hmm. as well as comment. I thought it was. Is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, one is that. Um, is this, that um, one of the things that can happen in a family mm. is that you learn about how people can behave otherwise, other than the way which you're told is normative. And that, I mean, this is the you know, origin of the idea of the black sheep mm. in the family, mm. Mm. very basic idea sure. in the sense of that family experience. Now, th there was a question in my mind about whether that counts as failure mm -hmm. uh, and how it counts as failure, um, which I'd like you to comment on. Yeah. And, and the second question has to do with this, that the intimacy of failure is also, is it connected to the fact that you don't initially understand it as failure at all? It's, not, it's your uncle. It's your uncle's behavior. And it's only later, as it were, that comes to be, the, the, the intimacy of the knowledge is connected to the timing of it in some sense. I, I just was wanted to ask you about those two points, because I'm, I'm very interested in this question of intimacy. Yeah. Um, firstly, I mean, this family, the, the, the one I've described here, the family of maternal uncles, uh, I don't want to generalize from this particular family into saying that this is what family is like. Um, my, the, the father's side of uh, my father's side of the family 
uh, which um, I mean, they would they would they're I think like conventional kind of <sighs> standards. Their failures too. I mean, they display uh, displaced family of landowners who on, went only to a certain extent into education, unlike my mother's side. Um, and failed miserably, without the benefit of that aggrandizing knowledge of having failed. I think this is what separates my mother's side, that they grew up in a culture of the modern in Bengal, which had to do with some kind of eclecticism of reference and um, a sense of being there at the right time. In a way, I don't think my my father's side of the family had that kind of historical sense of themselves. That that's one thing to to to, to distinguish the particular kind of idiosyncrasy uh, and 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 the cultural resonance of my my maternal side and their particular sorts of experiments with life and failures. Um, and I think yeah, I, I I think I was interested in not so much failure. Of course, they did fail in various ways, but in their in their failure to be normal. Um, again, the, obviously the culture gave them, besides the family, a very modern moment in Bengali history. It gave them the ability to occupy and contribute to that space. They were contributing to that space too, not just occupying it. They were also making it, as I'm sure many others were in Bengal, uh, making that space. That The creation of the space is an extremely important thing. Um, I don't know if it exists in that way today. And it's not just to be sort of uh, uh, identified with, let's say, charming old men or women who are eccentric. You know, as 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 in a in a, in a sitcom from from England from, from the 70s. Um, there's there's actually a, a, a cultural making going on, which is very important. Um, and to someone like me who was who was viewing it from a distance, it's important to emphasize that I'm not completely Bengali. That I, I was growing up in Bombay. Um, uh, and to, s to, to see that space and to see what was at work over there um, and to see what what the abnormal in in a sense that 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 is pejorative is also productive uh, I think that 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 was something that was important to me um, also over time this is uh, I mean, this was this this conviction was, uh, or this feeling was there, as I said, even when I was working on Lawrence. But this has now um, grown deeper. In in terms of what we lose when we can no longer think of the place of the wrong word, the inappropriate word, the inappropriate action. What is it that that we lose? How? Are we happy with that unfreedom that that leads to? Because it seems that both modernities and spiritual lineages are agreed upon the fact that you cannot arrive there merely by either by intention or by pursuing the right word, the right uh, the right action. How did how does that relate, however, to Flaubert's search for the right word, which seems oddly related to a taste for the idiosyncratic, the particular, the specific, in a very, very different way from the way we pursue the right in, a, in the gel general realm of morality. Uh, so th th these, these questions are raised, including the, 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 the moving outside of the domain of the Flaubertian, which I, which I encountered with Lawrence. 
where the man is actively encouraging the inappropriate thought and the inappropriate sentence. And for him it's a program. He's very conscious that to be tied down to the Flaubertian is, is, is a dead end. You know? Um, I encountered this, this, this texture of unevenness most stark, mm, not stark, most powerfully, most vividly in the poetry, in the book of, in the book, uh, in, in the collected poems, e edit, edited by Di Sola Pinto, I think, uh, Vivian Di Sola Pinto, if I, if I remember the name correctly. And, and, and I thought to myself, uh, I don't want a selected, the selected doesn't make sense with Lawrence. I want that rambling, meandering unevenness in which are also the extraordinary lines and, 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 and poems. And the question I was asking myself when I was 25 is, why do I want this? Uh, why, do I wha why am I to borrow a, a word from Foucault? Wh why do I want the discourse? So Foucault is using it in a different way. But it's important what's opening up at that time with us allowing ourselves to sacrifice the idea of the properly framed object into something that loses the frame around it so that we see its leakage into other things around it. I s uh, you see that with Lawrence. There's no sense of the finished poem and the unfinished one. There, 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 there's too much leakage I, from one to the other. And this, this I thought, I was certain that I, I had encountered this with my uncles. I was absolutely certain that I had a great patience and a taste for this. Because I don't want to make facile kind of connections between, oh, I read like this. because, But, but I was certain I had encountered discourse before. Any other? Right. One more. Yeah. So I'll uh, yes, listen yes. to both and yeah. So uh, yeah, so this question came to mind when you were talking. So I'll take three. I mean, I'll just yeah. hear the all, all the questions. Yeah. Uh, so this question came to mind when you were talking about how you said your mother was a wonderful singer, but you were questioning why she wasn't a household name. And I was remembering this passage from A Strange and Sublime Address where you talked in length about your uh, uncle's bathroom singing, right? And you dwelt and you talked about the words. So I was thinking about whether we can see this uh, failure of order, of, of this failure of speed, this failure of professionalism as a, a, a deliberate choice. Because sometimes the, desire, the act of not being successful in something we're good at is also a choice, right? So how could we look at that, that failure? The, f the, f the, the, the failure, failure of, of professionalism, of speed, of order, uh, in something you're good at. So yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll just hear. Uh, uh, the it, it was Gil and then Sunetra, or Sunetra and Gil. Um, when you talked about um, Flaubert and, and Lawrence and the sort of coming outside the frame and all of that, I was just wondering. What you th what your thoughts or what your feelings were about arbitration? Who d did you, you know, in, in having these experiences, did you also question, you know, the arbitration of? Can you mean? Can you tell me what like you mean the, by the that? arbiters? I mean, who? What is good? Oh yeah. What is actually good? You know, that yes. it, it's not just a matter of, not just that this is good and this is or isn't. But did you, did you also start to question? Absolutely. Who is to say? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just hear the uh, all three and then maybe reply in, in greater detail than just nodding and agreeing, and and then uh, then we can sort of have the next. Uh, um, my intervention had simply been to <laughs> try and uh, get uh, the question asked on the, uh, the the right into the conversation. But now that I have a mic, I, I will quickly ask a question, which is about the word idiosyncratic an idiosyncrasy <coughs> that um, you've been using. And um, I'm, I'm curious about its, um, its philological history, because it has come to mean something unique, even sort of slightly deviant, eccentric. Um, but 
in terms of its Greek etymology, it means um, one's own private mix. It comes from humoral, uh, the humoral world, the idea that all of us are mixtures of various elements. So every one of us is idiosyncratic in some way. <laughs> um, and uh, so what kind of violence have we committed against uh, um, an earlier ethos of mixture uh, that we have literally marginalized the idiosyncratic uh, in order to make it the negative concept by which we define an ideal of, of purity or, or normativity. Okay, so, um, so going to them one by one. Um, to, to, to do something, to, to elect to not do well at what you're good at. Is that what failure as a choice? Failure as a choice. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, because I don't have a ready answer to. Of course, I have. A, I mean, uh, I mean, I agree with uh, the validity of the question. But m b w what's in my head is more the opposite of of becoming a success at what you're not good at and a valid way of doing that, rather than the, of course there, there are many people who, exactly, I mean, many people who we might say have been successful, uh, who are also we, who we think to be uh, conventional, mediocre, or whatever, but, but there are also those who have been successful very, in a, in a, in a kind of challenging and path-breaking way, in things they weren't good at, or not supposed to have been good at doing, and and the 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 symposium that we had, I think maybe three or four years ago, which Sunetra attended, the deprofessionalization uh, symposium. Um, I had uh, as a speaker, one of the speakers was uh, the artist Jeremy Deller. So I I asked Jeremy Deller if he'd come because. Um, I, I, because he was, he's, he's now, I think, known to be one of Britain's kind of most interesting uh, and respected artists. Uh, I had read somewhere that he, he was no good at painting. So his, his, uh, his teacher in art school had said to him, you can never become an artist because you don't have talent. So, uh, so uh, he, for a while, became a curator and art historian. Then he decided that 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 kind of knowledge and experience as curator and art historian is precisely what he'd use, or is precisely what would enable him to do a kind of art, and that's what he did. So that's quickly to sort of say that there are productive ways of succeeding at what you fail in. As as with Della. Um, uh, go, going to your thing about the, the value, whether one question one begins to then think about what's good and and and, and, and what's bad uh, as as being whether these are actually universals or not or, or culturally specific. Yes, ab absolutely. I mean, um, I think the question comes up. You know, now it's the, the, the question has been to totally professionalized and exhausted. The, 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 the cultural uh, relativity of, of value. Uh, but the question has been posed extremely interestingly by, by writers with a particular investment in that question. The, the, the person who, the, the writer who poses it quite early on is, is Thomas Mann in, uh, uh, in Dr. Faustus. Where, where, where there's a conversation going on about what we consider to be bad in music and whether that's simply something that extends and, and challenges the, the, the language with which we decide what's good and bad. Um, so, so Man is an extremely interesting figure in that way in that he seems to be pursuing a, a, a more kind of realist form of fiction than some of his modernist contemporaries, but is keenly aware of, of, of the very form he's using and 
and turning it inside out. Um, so there are realist novelists who turn the form inside out. Uh, the, the person who hated Mann, D. H. Lawrence, uh, hated him for for being in death in Venice a Flaubertian. He's, he calls him the last the last sick progeny of Flaubert in a in a, in, a, in a vicious review of death in Venice. This is when he's trying to work out how to write after the Flaubertian success of Sons and Lovers. How to write? He's writing Women in Love at that time. Women in Love is, uh, again, I mean, seen to be in the great uh, tradition and all of that, or was. But it's a, it's a novel which turns itself inside out, the, the form of the realist novel. So it, uh, th these, are, these, are, these are writers who are testing this question of the, cul of the, of the specificity, the cultural specificity and fragility of these terms to do with good and bad with a peculiar investment, which again we need to reinvestigate because the professionalized post-theory view of these has left us so complacent and aesthetically at a dead end. It did put me in that position. It did, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and idiosyncrasy. And that, that's, a, that's a nice point. Uh, that all of us are idiosyncratic. Uh, and, and when did we... At what point did we, did we get colonized I, I, in, in a way that, well, ra it's a question of language, it's a question of idiosyncrasy in language and expression as well. I too am using it in a very special way, uh, um, and I'm, I'm trying to also distinguish it from, say, the sitcoms uh, uh, which enshrines idiosyncrasy in, in England, the, the, the figure of the eccentric, for instance, although I love the word eccentric as well. I, I, um, I like the way the w uh, when I was campaigning for the, the conservation of Calcutta's residential houses, saying that they all have family resemblances, but uh, n no two houses are identical, unlike all the other heritage districts in other parts of the world where uh, the, these houses are architecturally important because they all have the same design. Uh, Omar Tushin, when when supporting this, use the word eccentric of these houses. So again, the word eccentric can be rejuvenated in order to sort of take into account a particular kind of experimentation, which is what I also think idiosyncrasy encapsulates, including, as I said, uh, Im impediments to uh, um, expected forms of progression. Um, I think idiosyncrasy was there even in, 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 in modernism. As, as a way of, of, of understanding uh, uh, certain practices, certain ways of being. It's now that I think that, 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 I mean, when I started out, when I wrote A Strange and Civil Life Interest in 1991, it was still a meaningful word. It is now, it's now a word that has, has, has disappeared, more or less. So the colonization, I think, is, is quite recent. Um, so anyway, so... Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>